Greetings and welcome back. I'm pleased to have a very interesting guest on today to be talking about the evolution and nature of uh, politics, uh, particularly how the left has developed. We're going to be starting with uh, the, I think, interesting topic of Sam Harris, because Sam Harris is, I guess you could say, a canary in the coal mine uh, in the sense, because He's a guy that I would personally at least describe as a sort of moderate 90s style liberal. And I say this as somebody who's a bit older because that's what he just seemed like. A guy who is for most of the things people used to be on uh, for in terms of left-wing policy, but very little of the extreme progressivism that we see on display or have done for, for several years now. And he's a guy that uh, clearly has felt very estranged uh, in, in that sense because He's not a guy that can sort of transition to the right. He doesn't feel aligned with it. But but he clearly has made his point that he doesn't feel and represent the progressive view particularly well and doesn't feel comfortable there. So with that starting point, uh, I will welcome my guest again, uh, Outremer or Outremer or however you want to pronounce it. Uh, what What is up with Sam Harris as a kind of personification of of the the moderate liberal who just who's lost his way well just uh just just um to start off uh thank you for having me on and um it's good it's good to be here and as just to jump right into sam um it's i, I it's not just sam but with but with uh mr harris in particular i think there was a realization going forward for him you can, if you want to, between 2011 and 2013, when the new atheist movement was coming down from its high in the early 2000s, um, you, you have to remember these people were, they were writing best-selling books, they were selling um, merchandise by the millions, they were having these massive, almost stadium-like Coliseum-esque conferences where they were talking about the they didn't really discuss the Enlightenment, but the idea of the Enlightenment and the idea of rationality and the idea of secularism being this great centrifugal force that was going to unify all of humanity. And for Mr. Harris in particular, who's in many ways kind of the last standing member of the New Atheist, I've heard that used to refer to him a couple of times by different people and different sides of the political spectrum. I think that the disintegration of that movement really um and what that movement represented really hit him hard and if you want the sort of the sort of like marker for when this was occurring you can say it was uh chank uger versus sam harris uh at tyt i think back in 2013 2014. i vaguely remember and when you say he was hit hard do you mean the the first sort of ripples of of his misalignment with the left or the sort of the new left or the progressive left began is that what you mean or i think there was a yeah i think you can say that that was a formalization sam had been um or uh, really all the new atheists had been attacked by the new left um going all the way back to when they first appeared but there was a difference in tone now that you could see this going back and listening to these interviews that they felt they couldn't really ignore the attacks so they can sam has been called out on this endlessly about his um his stance regarding nuclear weapons and torture in the middle east mm -hmm. uh this is during during the during the bush years yeah um I think he's had an entire podcast where he sort of arti sort of articulated and walked through his moral logic for why his stances are what they are on this particular subject. Um, and and I think the point's been made, he never really had to worry about uh, um, his positions on religion regarding Muslims because, I mean, he doesn't live in the Middle East. Um, but when Sam started getting more explicit attacks from the left on these subjects, particularly going forward after 2011, um, during the during the age of atheism plus, um, people in my spheres have this thing we call the cathedral. We we believe in a consensus making apparatus in in politics, and 
the consensus making apparatus, what, what it's cool to be, at least here in the States, is it's cool to be left wing. And what Sam found himself, Sam and I think also Dawkins, uh, found themselves in the position shortly after Hitchens' death was they were on the wrong side of cool. And basically, uh, they've been fighting to stay within that ever since. So you can see the chain of logic work itself down. Even before Trump had appeared on the stage, uh, Harris, Dawkins had sort of gone back to Oxford and secluded himself um, and hasn't really emerged since, along with uh, Dennett and other figures like Grayling. But um, Dillahunty kind of went back to doing the podcast deal. Uh, Harris was the only one who tried to stick around in the public conversation. And you can see his frustration with a lot of uh, a lot of the direction that the left was going. I think that the Trump movement or the MAGA movement or the nationalist populist movement, however you want to define uh, the, the right wing sort of modern day Thermidian reaction that popped up around late 2015, uh, that largely became a lightning rod, something he could uh, blame for his real beef with the left, which was, of course, the fact that it was going further and further to the left. It was, yeah. it was descending couple, into a disconnectedness. A cu couple of points about Harris. I mean, the thing, I honestly think he was, say, you go to the, uh, referring to the old Turks or the so-called young Turks that, and having this, conver this conversation with Cenk and the left in general, he honestly thought that these people were sort of good faith actors and so when he's trying to ground a position on nuclear weapons or torture it's it's you know for his own reasons obviously it's well thought out he, he, he thinks that people are going to pay attention to the details of the argument rather than just fall in line with a particular uh, uh, form that you're sort of just checking off the boxes on like, or do you torture bad not good you know whatever um and yeah. he actually thought people would pay attention to the nuances of his argument and one thing that harris has that i think they all have but and maybe because he is in the public spotlight is he is for all his mildness and he's the master of meditation he's just really really obsessed with reputational damage i mean i, I think he's a multimillionaire. He, he he could be banished from public life and he would be fine you know, financially, but that's not enough. I mean, he, he really, really worries about the consequences of how people perceive him. And I, I think to your point, he's, he's not aware that these days, anything that isn't progressive, um, you know, basically left, that's kind of the new left, basically progressive is well, just not right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, not just progressive, but woke progressive. Woke, yes. the sort of with a sort of neoliberal undertone. So you're supposed to get my sense of this new coalition is that you're supposed to get the joke. You're supposed to be progressive on the outside, neoliberal on the inside. Hmm. If we can get the progressive social policies and economic policies that we want, sure, fine. But if not, you're supposed to you're supposed to get the joke and vote blue no matter who. I've had this discussion a couple of times with various people. I even had this discussion about a week or two ago uh, where, where apparently I'm in the position of defending Glenn Greenwald because he's not considered on the left because of his critique of Joe Biden in the lead up to the 2020 election, which led to him resigning from The Intercept. I didn't um, know that he resigned. Interesting, because Greenwald oh, yeah. was a, a longtime foe of Harris, actually. Oh, yes. Uh, and Greenwald is another one of these individuals who is he's more radical. He was more he was further to the left than Harris. But he's again, he's like Tim Pool. He's one of these left wingers who's who doesn't seem to get the joke, who, who doesn't really under. I see much of this with all due respect towards um, figures like uh, uh, the Weinstein brothers and the intellectual dark web. Mm -hmm. I admire the. Uh, the attempt to create an intellectual space in which people can come forward and actually express their opinions. I think that that's, a, that's necessary. The problem is that with all of these people, the similarity I see just is not that they're, um, is not their position on the political spectrum, it's their idealism. So for Harris, um, Harris had this ideal, and it was really an ideal that was implicit in the entire New Atheist movement, that uh, once we got rid of all of this 
this religious crap um, once we sufficiently attacked uh, evangelical Protestantism in the United States, which was on which was a group that was considered on the political right. The results of that would be a sort of clearing space, uh, secularists and rationalists and I uh, would be able to fill the void left by religion in places like university and in the next generation. And then we they would come forth a, a new age of, of reasons, skepticism that would naturally find everybody left of center. Not hard left, but left of center. And once we, you know, and this was also implicit in the kinds of things, I think the more importantly, they weren't so much concerned about undertaking this process with Christians in the West. I think more explicitly, Sam, in particular, wanted this process, wanted this to be the process by which uh, we spread secularism through the Middle East. Um, it was fairly clear from 2006 onwards that there were major geopolitical uh, shockwaves running through the blood of American, the lifeblood of American politics. Uh, the United States had not sufficiently answered the spiritual challenge or, or the philosophical question that Osama bin Laden had posed to the United States. Um, and there, the McWorld theory and the narrative of the 1990s, this ever-growing, ever-expanding monopole of global power, that was, that was hemorrhaging. Um, the sort of the vision of um, um, shoot, what was the name of the political scientist who who made the end of uh, uh, end of uh, Francis Fukuyama. Francis, the vision of Francis Fukuyama, the vision of the Clinton administration, the vision of the forever the summer of, of love, yeah. the end of history, um, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and all the good stuff. Or, um, that vision was essentially coming apart by 2006. I think the new atheist movement was an attempt to try and rescue that narrative of of modernism for, really from itself and uh by 2011 it was just patently obvious that um that we were we were not headed towards that um that ideal but the uh but rather than sort of have this deeper dialectic, which I think a lot of the people who were involved in that sort of skeptosphere were having, what we instead got was the culture war. Going forward after 2012, uh, the political left in the country started to really awaken to its own political power. And this is the, the, the you, can, you can see the chain of logic play itself out. From 2012, uh, more and more, less and less, the left was looking uh, particularly after the second Obama administration. The left was looking less to talk with its political opponents and much more to... Um, and Just it started ram everything down they want, the people's throats they wanted. Well, very explicitly, yeah. they wanted the... They wanted idealists, but they wanted those idealists who would be loyal to the party, if that makes sense. So yeah, yeah. they want Glenn. They want Glenn Greenwald, but they want Glenn Greenwald to support Joe Biden. No. <laughs> so the question then, as well as my sort of thinking out loud and things I've said on my channel several times over, that I think that the left has been has has won largely, and and maybe 2012 or whenever the whenever the stuff started in earnest, that was sort of the the crystallization of the realization that yeah actually we won we can just go ahead you know full steam we're not we don't need to uh pull our punches anymore it's it's over the right is lost basically and to my mind that seems at least partly responsible for the the, the openness of of wokeness and just the directions they want to push things in absolutely um another way to think about it is it's like uh it's like a rubber band once the once the tension is suddenly released on one side, once um, you know who uh, I want to say it was Christopher Caldwell, the guy who wrote um, Age of Entitlement. Um, yeah, I heard of it. Yeah, uh, great book. It really sort of tracks the meta narrative and the cultural conversations that have been going on in the states between the left and the right since the sixties. Um, and but two thousand, I've heard it referred to as a couple of things. Some people have called it the Great Awakening. Um, it, it was, 
that was the year in which there were many different factors that fed into why this was the case. But um, that was the year in which this the there was a realization in the bloodstream of the left wing politics. This is when you got more explicit talk, not from right wingers, but from left wingers about uh, things like demographics. Um, but in a much more sort of braggadocio manner, um, this is when you started getting uh, various figures being um, essentially purged from the left. This is when that process really started to come into its own, starting with the New Atheist Movement, which in many ways had been a pet project um, of that wing of the left, in my opinion. But this was also when you started getting things like... Um, uh, how to how to phrase this politely um, for the YouTube? <laughs> um, well, this I is when you, the effort. this is when you started getting more explicit talks uh, regarding, uh, let us say, ethnicities yeah. in Western politics. Yeah. Um, all of this sort of stuff that had been. It was there, but it had been very sufficiently camouflaged since the days of Ted Kennedy and the Heart Seller Act. And if, if they had talked, like, I think most of the audience is probably aware. Um, if you go back and you look into, uh, into, the, into, into the kinds of ideas that were floating around during the 60s when they passed the Heart Seller Act, you can see um, elements of this thinking mixed in there. But the only kinds of people who were able to who were talking about it back in the 60s were sort of the Pat Buchanan paleo conservative types mm. and they were they were not considered quote unquote cool they were not part of the cool kids club they were not part of the institutional apparatus if the left wing had talked about this back in uh, the way that they're talking about the right back in the 60s um no, they would never have gotten any of their policies through they would have been blown out of the water and every one yet day. right i mean they were still yeah, exactly. fighting they, the war yeah, yeah. They, they were still in the middle of the war um, but it's exactly what you said. By 2012, um, the left came to the realization that they had largely won. Um, there's many different factors for that. And the right was also in the midst of its own crisis. Uh, we really saw this with its relationship with iconoclastic figures like Ron Paul. Mm. Um, and so Sam is essentially, as far as Sam Harris goes, um, his issue really going going all the way up to the to his most recent podcast the republic of lies is yeah. he he's found himself in this situation where um he's being continuously forced to compromise with his his quote unquote side the the people that he likes the people who are in power um and by compromising with these people he's taking positions that I don't think Sam is a stupid person. This is a man, like you said, multimillionaire, has a very high IQ, got a very, um, got an Ivy League education, comes from a wealthy background. Um, but he's, he's taking positions um, in real time that actively contradict positions that he held even just five years ago. Um, and he's doing that because he has to stay in frame. He has to at least stay somewhat topical for an audience that's going further and further into the realm of figures like Fauch and figures like ContraPoints and figures like uh, a, a lot of the other sort of um, um, individuals that we've seen pop up, particularly in internet spheres in the last well, here's a two question. or three years. Do you think, I mean, because Sam Harris's TDS, or for the audience, if you're not familiar, probably should be a you know, Trump derangement syndrome, it seems so extreme that at times... I, I, I'm not sure if it's authentic, and maybe you're alluding to that. I mean, do you, on the other hand, sometimes he really does seem to really, really think Trump is that bad. And I can definitely well, see not... the. Yeah, sorry, go on. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's just cause I can see the angle of him trying to placate the, um, the increasingly woke left uh, by doing that, sort of to give, show his credentials. But I also think he's very much bothered by Trump. So it's kind of, I'm not sure if it's an either or, but I do think it's authentic. I'm not sure if he's just. Two things can be, two things can be true at the same time. Um, yeah. I think he, I think he genuinely, I don't think it's just Trump. Um, I thought for a long time it was Trump. 
Um, and I've spoken to people who are uh, familiar with him on a more personal level. And, and uh, from what I've heard, at least from them, is that, uh, that it is real. But um, I, I think it's a combination of things. I think it's general fear of reputational damage, as you've mentioned. Uh, he has to stay in frame. So he's pushed into these positions that are more and more disconnected from reality, in which he's um, almost coming out in favor of it really does sound, uh, his latest 35 to 40 minute rant really does sound um, almost borderline violent. But um, it was pretty clear, it was pretty clear after the Scott Adams podcast that he was not going to have anybody from, again, I don't know what you would call the Trumpian movement or the nationalist populist movement, but there were there's, I can think of at least a half dozen figures that emerged in the last five years that could articulate a lot of, um, a lot of the issues that uh, the Trump coalition was attempting to bring to the attention of uh, what we might call the American aristocracy. But uh, I think particularly after um, the Scott Adams and the Charles Murray podcasts, um, neither of whom are Trumpians, but both of whom brought a lot of heat on Harris himself. Uh, that Harris was, uh, he was interested in being seen as being involved in the public conversation, particularly as regards to cultural icons like Jordan Peterson um, and, you know, the intellectual dark web. But uh, in actual fact, I don't think he was ever really, it's been, it's been a half a decade since this thing really got going. And yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I get told this by people who still, uh, who still enjoy his content. Um I, you haven't found one guy in five years that you'd be interested in having. It doesn't even have to be a cordial conversation. You can frame it as a debate. It's your podcast, but uh, I, I don't think this is accidental. I think yeah. that I think it's it's got to be an element of fear, um, and it's also the fact that he genuinely hates not Trump but Red America in general. Yeah. For the record, I mean, <clears throat> I listen to Harris out of just habit. I've been following him for about 16 years off and on and so it's kind of it's kind of like morning coffees for some people i I do i have lots of criticisms but again for for a decade and a half plus i've been listening to the guy uh, and sometimes i'm actually genuinely interested i I credit him with some insights that have helped me in my own life but yeah i do think that there was a time when he was he thought it was okay just to talk to a guy like Scott Adams or even Charles Murray. But notice when his motivation for talking to Charles Murray was to vindicate himself uh, because he's obsessed with a kind of sincerity and honesty in some way, Uh, vindicate himself from the possible accusation that he too had thrown Charles Murray under the bus without actually having examined his claims and what he actually had said and written. Um, not necessarily to have a conversation per se with somebody with uh, of differing views but yeah i think he he's not dumb and he's realized that certain people there's no longer any room for him to talk to people in the quote-unquote right i think peterson is still an option peterson is very safe though there's nothing radical about peterson uh, whatsoever um so i think that that's still an option but yeah I'm I'm curious what he's going to do because most recently I don't know if you paid attention. Um, he he's just completely this IDW thing, and I always thought that was burned his uh, burned his contact list. Yeah, yes. pretty much. I, I don't think I think the ID is it's a retarded name. I, mean, I don't really suppose yeah. it's mean, but but for what it is, uh, the ID intellectual dark web that he just wants to kind of do his own thing, but. He, he has less and less space in which to maneuver. You know, he can, yeah, he can get scientists on and, and he's, that those are always okay. No one faults him for talking to neuroscientists and physicists. But clearly he, as you point out, he wants to be part of the public conversation. Those types of talks are highfalutin talk, talks for people with kind of autistic interests. They're not, I mean, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, talk to a, a physicist talking about the many worlds theory, but he also wants to take part in that greater cultural political uh, conversation and that's really what's becoming increasingly as you pointed out closed off to him because he's just it's just he's stuck in a corner yeah. i i don't think he's going to go so far because he is principled as to sort of 
completely signal for wokeness. I don't think one day we're going to start hearing them say, well, men and women um, are basically the same. And um, I don't think he's ever going to go there. But yeah, I, I definitely see him because he is a pretty big icon in, in, in the podcast sphere. And I think uh, it's very, very noticeable. Uh, but I'm not one thing I, I mean, I'm curious to sort of pick your, your brain on this. I don't think quote unquote elites, especially the ones in Washington are that concerned with wokeness. I often think that the wokeness stuff is just throwing the dogs a bone well, so they can keep on with their neoliberal po- political and, and foreign policies. Like, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, there's 10,000 genders and you know, have fun, have fun, kids. Um, we're going to keep on, you know, bombing Yemen and uh, making sure that uh, <clears throat> the petrodollar is a thing. And But, but you know, have, have fun. Uh, well, that's what's... Yeah. I'm sorry. No, I'm done, pretty much. I th- um, I, that's what's going to be fascinating about um, the most likely upcoming presidency is um are we is this uh is it is this a quote-unquote return to normal um i have my suspicions that it will be but uh again the joke the the joke is is that you're supposed to be in favor of things like intersectionality you're supposed to signal that and you'll be punished if you don't signal that the reality is is that um the the reality is the joke is a progressive surface and a neoliberal reality uh, at the end of the day, um, when when the doors close and the and it actually comes down to brass tacks, uh, the the way that coalition currently functions is, um, you know, uh, if if it were more honest, it would be Biden coming out after uh, after the election is over. Okay, we all know why we're here. Here's the split. Uh, here's where we divide up the pie. Here's where we you know dish out the butter. This is where we uh, give out the goods, um, parcel out the spoils. Uh, you're supposed to get the joke. You're supposed to get the joke that um, everybody's everybody in that coalition is fundamentally self-interested. Intersectionality is a tool by which they can they can frame a unified front. But you've basically got um, oh man, again, how how to phrase this uh, politely? Uh, y- you've basically got very very. Um, You've got coalitions in that group that have very, very strong in-group preferences, let us say, mm-hmm. um, that in many ways are conservative in their social policy. But the reality is, is that they vote in or they vote to be a part of that coalition. They show due deference and due loyalty uh, because they're expecting um, they're expecting the perks. Uh, they they want, in my opinion, if you if you look into how a lot of these coalitions are framed. Uh, they're expecting to get a cut of the loot when the music stops playing. So I do agree. It's um, how much of this is going to is going to work, uh, whether or not they'll ever actually manage to get, you know, f- nationalize everything, UBI, uh, turn America into Scandinavia. And when they say Scandinavia, they don't actually mean Germany or Sweden. Uh, where you can have laws against fat people, what they actually mean is John Len- uh, John Lennon's Imagine. Um, whether or not they're ever re- going to get that is is still up for debate. But the social stuff, I don't think that that coalition really really cares that much about the social stuff. It's, the social it's, stuff it's interesting it. because with the old Turks, they they actually, I mean, whether you like it or not, they, I think they're actual progressive. They don't typically like neoliberal policy. They're pretty consistent about that. Um, they like all the social stuff, obviously. I think, see, that the TYT is an interesting case. I assume that's who you're talking about. Yes. Um, uh, TYT is an interesting case. I think they do fall into this frame. Uh, did you see the recent drama with uh, Cenk Uger and labor unions? Uh, no, um, no, no, no. Let, uh, well, there's another element. Um, you know how Cenk has been doing the rounds uh doing these sort of like funding drives where he asks is pretty much just spends two or three hours begging his audience to give him 30, 50,000, 30, 40, 50,000 hmm. dollars. Um, or where he, um, million dollar, uh, a million dollar dish outs from Katzenberg and allying himself, uh, with the media arm of, <laughs> of the Qatari government, um, in order to get funding. Now, granted, you know, it, 
neoliberal reality, capitalism makes the world go around. You get you want to play, you got to pay. Um, but I, I think what makes uh, TYT what their business model actually is, what they're selling to is they're selling explicitly to a progressive base. Um, they're not right. TYT isn't making you uh, YouTube videos and um, articles for someone like me or someone like you. Uh, they're making articles for the kinds of people who can you. Oh, excuse me. Um, they're making articles for um, the kinds of the kinds of people who unironically enjoy Sam Cedar and Jimmy Moore <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, who the kinds of people who, you know, who go who watch The Daily Show uh, with John Stewart but, or John uh, Oliver. It's interesting you mentioned Jimmy Dory because. I, my understanding is that he, he was not woke enough. And so he left and there's even in that he's sort of gone his own way. And there, there's now a conflict between him uh, and some of these others. I don't know if I've misunderstood the situation, but it's in, in, speaking to the sort of general things we've been talking about, uh, another example of somebody potentially at least who, who did not fully go woke and it always had a kind of skepticism didn't totally give in to, to the extent I've paid attention to, to TDS, was a little bit more shrewd in his analysis. Um, I'm pretty sure he's not in good standing with the Young Turks, uh, Jim Muir, but I uh, could be wrong about that. Um, I'm not familiar with that. I know he still has his own show, yeah. um, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it did. But I... I, I, you still get these hints, like um, the the way in which uh, there's there's a great YouTuber who's really funny. Name is Dame Pesos. He's he's got an entire uh, um, he's got an entire sort of um, comedic uh, comedic cutout of the various uh, contra contra uh, controversies regarding um, regarding TYT management. But um, I I. Uh, the, the best way that I could phrase this is the neoliberal reality expresses it in all of these progressive outlets, whether it's Fox um, or whether it's Democracy Now or whether it's TYT. Uh, for all the talk about, you know, the Koch brothers and all these evil right wing billionaires making dough off of the defense contracts, contractors and um, all that sort of stuff. Uh, all these people are funded by groups like the Ford Foundation, Center for American Progress, um, Tom Steyer, Bloomberg, Giuliani, uh, those, or excuse me, not Giuliani. Uh, shoot, I forget, his name slipped my mind. Uh, Katzenberg in the case of the TYT. Um, they have their own billionaires. They have their own power base that keeps them afloat. Um, they have their own neoliberal backers, uh, and they ain't going anywhere near that. Uh, Cenk is very, very aware that uh, Anna doesn't work for him for charity. Um, what well, they're I mean, primarily they're criti critical of, of certain policies of Biden. I mean, they don't. They're not. I mean, weren't they Bernie yeah. Bros? Supposed they, to be? they they think uh, they think that they're going to get another shot at the apple in four years, which is part of the way this whole vote blue no matter who uh idea comes through they think that i mean even vouch came out recently and sort of admitted what a lot of people in my spheres have been saying for years which is that um no he said he's sphere, by the way the reactive sphere yeah, yes uh the reactive sphere um he, he sort of came out in braggadocio fashion is like you know when we look at history there does actually seem to be a progressive direction i think we're gonna <laughs> like, you know he doesn't doesn't understand that he's he's confirming a lot of what we've been saying even though he'll fight against us to the death because the kinds of conclusions we draw about politics and about power and about history over the last particularly the last 200 years um but but he but you do see this um there 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 is a there's a, a recognition on the political on the far left that uh, so long as they stay in the game, uh, they think eventually that they'll get, they'll, they'll win the kind of victories that uh, seemed so promising during the age of Bernie Sanders. And they point to things like 47% uh, young people in favor of socialism and all that sort of deal. Uh, whether or not um, that's a reality, I, I can't say definitively. 
I would say that that's a coin that's still in the air. Uh, will it go in the Will it go in the direction of the neoliberals, which is one kind of hell, or will it go in the direction of uh, this other coalition, which is another kind of hell? But the uh, but the one thing I would say that we can draw from this, and this really is starting to come out, and you know, all of these centrist types that put themselves forward, like Harris and like the new atheists, who are moving, uh, moving in, being forced to move in di in directions. Where their positions are disconnected from uh, disconnected from reality, um, and it's creating a sort of undertone of um, of sadism, particularly in the way that they talk to uh, to members of the right within their audience. Uh, almost sort of the sort of scapegoating and the uh, the how the excuse my French, but the the sort of the how fucking dare you question me. Yeah. um approach to uh approach to um to people in their audience who have been trying to point out places where they think are go uh the the speaker is going wrong that mentality has has been spreading through all corners of the left in the last year it was just very interesting seeing it come from um from a man who uh who put himself forward just 10 12 years back as the great answer to a lot of these cultural and philosophical and maybe even civilizational uh, fissures that were starting to open up. Now, uh, one more nail in that coffin, I suppose. One, I guess, a much bigger question, because I know you've been interested in it. I mean, where did it go wrong? Did it go wrong with the French Revolution? Did it go wrong with Martin Luther? Did it go wrong? I mean, when, where, where, did, where did, I mean, I don't personally, my view, and I mean, I'm sort of, I don't, I don't, I don't think you can. It's not reasonable to pinpoint a specific uh, period of time to. And I think just humans have been around for a long time, but yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very long process. We, it's uh, not everything. I, 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 I don't, I don't try to go too deep into. Uh, cons uh, you know, you know, it's it's all the pro, it's all the. Uh, all the result of the globalists and other groups. Mm -hmm. um, but the French Revolution I, seems to be a good. I, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. Looking in, looking at the history, uh, the the French Revolution was the reason why it lives on in Western in 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 Western memory even to this day um, was a because of the figure who emerged out of the French Revolution, who then subsequently spread those. A it was. It lives in the minds of the political right as the event um, that really, even for normie cons, uh, they understand that there's something about the French Revolution that they need to be afraid of. Um, and it lives on in the mind of the left as, oh, hell yeah, storm the Bastille. <laughs> it's yeah. like, uh, um, uh, they, they look at uh, the French Revolution as like uh, Antifa paradise. Um, well, that's pretty similar. I mean, uh, and they, well, they're, they're getting away with shenanigans that even Antifa can't get away with these days. So, well, uh, it's pretty it's pretty obvious that that's what the direction that they want to hold in. But the, the French Revolution is notable because it was sort of a lightning rod in uh, for enlightenment for enlightenment ideas. And going forward after the French Revolution, the the figure who rose to power out of the uh, the madness of of that conflagration then. On the one on the one hand, he he totally uh, in him in his own character um, embodied the failure of the French Revolution, the failure of liberal Enlightenment ideas to change the world, um, because he was basically a reactionary dictator who emerged out of a Jacobin party. <laughs> hmm. um, and uh, but on the other hand, he spread these ideas all across Europe through his. Through his subsequent conquests, I'm talking about Napoleon, obviously. Yes, I mean, I'm, I'm talking Napoleon. about uh, yeah. Bonaparte. Yeah. Um, the the Napoleonic Wars uh, spread these ideas through the bloodstream of the entirety of Europe, and by extension, because Europe was emerging as the global power at the time, uh, it spread these ideas not only through Europe but through the bloodstream of almost every culture that Europe came into contact with. Mm. Uh, out the guns of out the guns of uh, of uh, the Imperial Army, but yeah. I don't, think, I don't think that that was um, 
it, it's not like uh, history was written or, or it, I think that it's been a continuous process going forward from the French Revolution and from uh, the late Enlightenment that sort of leads us to postmodern cyberpunk 2077 Great Reset territory that we find ourselves in today. I'm not embarrassed to say that I have that game preloaded, but fair enough. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. What I've been hearing is a day one patch of 50 gigabytes. I'm yeah, okay, that's, that's fair. But I mean, I I can separate. I, I mean, I don't want to get on tangent. I, I, I don't think that's a particularly politically motivated game. I think it's it exists in its own sphere, and an exception exact, exact has that. It, it It's the politics of that sphere rather than... I just, nowadays. I think, it's, I think yeah. it's an incredibly well picked game. Like uh, the, yeah. the reason why it sticks in a lot of people's conscious memory, the reason why everybody's like, "Oh shit, it looks so cool," is because uh, it's got the sort of Grand Theft Auto mixed with uh, Blade Runner twenty forty nine aesthetic, which, yeah. you know, it's. I, I think again, this is this feeds back into this feeds back into why the left is doing what it's doing. What what the left promised. Uh, America in the world is that we'd have um, we'd we'd have John Lennon's version of Scandinavia. We'd have clean streets and healthy people and endless amounts of good sex and drugs and good food and mm-hmm. nationalize everything and we never have to work again. Uh, what it what it increasingly looks like like that was the promise of the '90s is that everybody's going to be a part of McWorld and it's going to be awesome um, and we're not going to have any real problems anymore. McWorld, uh, actually, I, I get it, but that's the first time you using that term, McWorld. I have to say, I've never heard McWorld before, but uh, it's uh, you know uh, Benjamin Barber, uh, Benjamin Barber's McWorld theory. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Interesting. Um, that that was the implicit promise of of progressivism and neoliberalism, sort of like a, a, a globally expanding version of John Rawls uh, of the Kingdom of God. Um, you know, without, of course, without the church or without God, but uh, nevertheless, it's, it has quasi-theological uh, connotations nonetheless. But increasingly what people are realizing what we're actually going to get is we're going to get something like Cyberpunk or Blade Runner or, yeah. uh, or um, you know, Warhammer without the cool Catholic space fascism to make it topical. Yeah, um, yeah. We're, we're, we're looking much less at the, uh, the bright, shiny, clean, environmentally, uh, in, environmentally safe, uh, progressive future. And more and more what we're, what we're seeing is a sort of globalized version of Brazil. And, um, I, I think that that's expressing itself in the public consciousness more and more. And it's demanding answers that I don't think those in power are, are, uh, deign to give. Well, I mean, and then. There's a question that if you look at Trump as a reaction to all of these trends, and it seems unlikely he's going to be uh, continue to be president based on what I've looked at. Not that I've spent too much time, kind of sick of it, but um, you would think that after Biden Harris do the runs, um, that yeah, that there'll be some other figure that's going to sort of take the place of Trump because people are going to be fed up with. You know the usual neoliberalism coupled with uh, the awakening, uh, because one, I mean, something has to give, and yet I don't foresee that thing giving in the same way that things have given in the past, whether it was the 20th century or the 19th or the 18th. Uh, I, I, for a variety of reasons, I just don't see, for example, you know, violent revolution on the horizon. Certainly not in the United States, uh, and I'm not sure. I think one difference I'd like to point out that I, I've pointed out repeatedly is that material levels of comfort uh, seem to be a big mediating factor in this. Uh, and so when you have well, let me ask that, a question. Yeah. When when you say violent revolution, do you mean violent revolution from the political right? Like we're all going to get out into get out into the streets with our guns and our flags and our dip and. Yeah. I, I don't know, like yeah, char- I don't, char- I don't see that necessarily. Yeah, happening. charge the fields of Bannockburn and yeah. scream freedom like uh, yeah. Mel Gibson. No, I, I don't, I don't see that either. Um, this has been one of the things a lot of the people in my spheres have been advocating for is there needs to be, and I've been having a lot of conversations with neoconservatives. Ironically enough, of uh, they, they for some reason want to talk to me about. Uh, they think I'm a paleocon. I've had to explain to them the difference between. Uh, 
between my positions and uh, a paleo conservatives positions, but they apparently want to open up a dialogue about this and figure out where the differences on the right really are. Um, I don't see, yeah, I, I obviously, I, I don't see that as happening. I mean, you've got a couple of groups that are active, like the Groypers, uh, who are trying to transfer internet ideas to, I, I, I won't mention the other group that's active IRL that's gotten media articles, um, but they, they wear Hawaiian shirts a lot. Yeah, and, and they, they, the point is they don't have actual real power. And, and the, yeah, and the, and the, and the, that's the issue is is that you know from our perspective, the the problem is is that it's not that these groups aren't sincere. It's not that these groups don't have re relatively reasonable political demands in a in a in a very country like the United States, in which you have state laws and all that sort of stuff. The problem is is that they don't have any power. Uh, the the left wing coalitions. When you get a, a million leftists on the street, that's something to be afraid of because you've and it's not just because the left wing has uh, a moral narrative that drives them forward. They've got funding, they've got institutions, they've got the media, which does still matter. They have all of these other sectors of power. Uh, they have a legal um, they have a legal means to punish you uh, if if you don't have. Um, if you don't have your ducks in a row and spew the uh, spew the party line of diversity, inclusivity, multiculturalism, and all that sort of stuff, there are laws on the books that will allow them to levy very vicious, uh, uh, levy real pain against you and whatever organization that you are. I, how do we have that on the right? <laughs> I just, I. I don't see it like I see I see legitimate anger and I see um, uh, I see a desire for political change and all of that's legitimate. But I don't see um, and part of this is the problem of the right wing leadership. I, I don't see the ability of the right to levy uh, levy power against these institutions. Uh, the days where, you know, the American political classes are afraid of 40 percent of an electorate, uh, those days are over. Now, whether or not that's going to go over well for the various groups that are part of the intersectional coalition, we'll find out. But I don't see um, I don't see the like I said, part of this is the problem of the right wing re leadership. I, I think the right wing is much the right wing leadership, the figures who are put forward to quote unquote lead the right, uh, the national review types, uh, to a lesser degree, some of the guys over at the Daily Wire. Um, who I'm sure your audience uh, can probably guess who I'm talking about. Uh, they seem less interested in any kind of public activism. They seem much more interested in managing the right and uh, just podcasting, yeah. Rush Limbaugh style. Gina, uh, they up uh, 7.9%. Uh, everything's fine, guys. Don't worry about it. So, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, that, and so I see then, I mean, since the right is powerless effectively, um, do you see a sort of consolidation, you know, I don't know, some, to the extent that the right exists in, in, in the coastal areas, they're just going to sort of head out to Wyoming and Montana and then dig in their heels and make their last stand uh, until the well, uh, left comes from there as well? I, I guess. Uh, th see, that's the thing that I keep hearing is, you know, e even even Alex Jones was like doing the round saying, we got to go back to the land. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> what it means is that uh, right wingers need to move further into the country and sort of, like you said, could try to consolidate. I, um, there's been a lot of talk about what can actually be done. Maybe that is the only thing that can be done. Uh, my sort of question is, I'm without without doxing myself. I I do know uh, I do have family that have done this. That you know moved out to states that have uh, net zero immigration and mm -hmm. um, are have you know available land for an affordable price. That are fairly the, the issue is that these these regions of the country are geopolitically isolated. Like uh, it, it matters whether or not you have a physical presence as an activist base in a place like Washington D.C. Um, yeah. It matters whether or not you can put uh, a thousand people outside of a congressman or a senator's office. Having again, without doxing myself, having done a little bit of work in politics myself. Mm -hmm. Um, I can tell you it matters whether or not uh, you have a presence in places like Philadelphia and in places like New York. Um, you can have um, you can have 
I don't want to say revolutions because that sounds a little hyperbolic, but you can have successful populist movements emerge out of the hinterlands and you can have uh, successful defenses of local communities at the national scale that has occurred in history, but it doesn't occur. But what I see is my fear with the sort of go back to the hinterlands approach, go back to the land approach is that so many people are going to move out to these areas and then they're, they're going to become politically inactive. Um, they're not going to actually learn their lessons about why they moved into the interior of the country. They're going to move into the interior of the country and they're going to find themselves in relatively homo uh, homogeneous, uh, soft religious communities that they uh, enjoy. They're 20 years away from, or maybe 10 or 20 years away from any kind of uh, progressivism moving out to these communities. The school systems are still nice. The crime is uh, fairly under control. The drug crisis is not as severe. And they're going to go back to sort of uh, Ron Paul libertarian talking points. <laughs> I've already kind of seen this. It's it's the, uh, what, what do they call it? The grill pill? Um, grill and, pill. As in what you, you're, uh, I'm trying to envision this, the grill pill, like you you're in the middle of Wyoming and you know, it's clear sky. Yeah, it's just like, out it's, I think, grill barbecue. Yeah. It's like, it's like the, the, the boomer, the boomer yeah. meme where he's yeah. got the, he's got the, the Heineken and he's just, uh, he's grilling and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that would be my fear of the political right. I, it's not that I don't like the sort of Texas friendly, uh, attitude of the political right in this country, but there needs to be, there needs to be a much more succinct conversation about power very explicitly directed towards the political right across the entirety of the country. There needs to be a deeper understanding about how power is actually wielded in this country and about what you can expect if you fall back. Retreating only makes sense if you're regrouping to launch, um, if, you're, if you're regrouping to, to move in a different direction. Um, it, it only makes sense to fall back further and further towards Moscow if you're planning to use the winter to your advantage in, in any of, you know, the Napoleonic Wars or World War II. Yeah. Otherwise, you're just giving it, otherwise, you're just giving up ground. Um, and uh, the, the nature of the epistemology, the way in which this uh, belief system that's starting to manifest itself uh, as the, the central belief system in American politics, uh, it's expansionist. Uh, it's not just just expansionist on the domestic front, it's expansionist on the global front. And yes, it does identify uh, people who are would be described as on the political right, regardless of their regardless of whether they voted for Trump or not. Uh, it views them as without sounding too hyperbolic, it, it does view them as um, enemies of the state who need to be politically reeducated. Uh, this is the thing that's been so alarming for me is I suspected something like this, but I didn't expect so many people coming out and using words like mass reprogramming and um, calling for industrial scale political re-education of entire groups. Learn to inside code, bro. Yeah, well, it's not it's not just that it's 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 not just learn to code. It's not just fuck you. Go figure your own job situation out as we sell your jobs to China. It's uh fuck you, we're going to sell your jobs to China and we're going to lord our power over you and uh, you're you're going to, and we're going to teach you to swallow our bullshit and call it caviar. Yeah. It's, um, like I said, it's it's very interesting seeing this more sadistic element start to manifest itself. Do you think your, Atlas, your average conservative guy in Wyoming has any clue about this? Because I've encountered a lot of people from those hinterlands places and I mean, there are a lot, sir, when the, um, without naming his name, when, when the, the riots occurred in, in the summer due to you know what and you know who, uh, I remember talking to people and who were in the hinterlands and it just, it, nothing changed for them, right? Because they yeah. weren't living in urban centers. And so I get a sense that. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's a mixed bag, but by and large, um, you do, you do run into certain figures that are from the hinterlands who are having their sort of their custer moment. There's where they come over the hill and it's, you know, holy shit. Yeah. But, um, uh, there, there are certain figures who, you know, are even active on podcasts and YouTube who, who are starting to re really starting to recognize, okay, we've actually got a, yeah, you know, it's Houston. We've got a problem here. Um, but by and large, uh, like I said, uh, 
homogenous areas, soft religion, good schools, uh, um, fairly low land rates, and the governments out there, because they're a little bit more connected to their communities, are still somewhat responsive to the needs of those communities and constituencies they rule over. Um, there's there's still a lot of grilling going on in these uh, yeah. these hint worlds. I, I like that term. I have to adopt that and make world since uh, that's a new one. <laughs> make world and grilling the, the grilling life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's certainly not an optimistic picture to to paint for the right, um, since I think anyone who's been paying attention can see that the right's basically lost uh, and if you if you have right wing sympathies, there's just not no real place to go. Obviously. The on the online, the internet has become, I guess, the hub where people with alternative views, reactionary views, um, and just views that are deviant from mainstream progressive neoliberalism uh, go, and that's great. It's great for, I guess, let, getting some, letting out some steam above all, you know, because you're frustrated and you, know, you have somebody to talk to about this stuff, but. It doesn't translate into power, and I think this is, I mean, the one thing that people, like the Foucaults of the world, I mean, they, they understood that it's all about power. You look at the issue of free yeah. speech, for example, I there are very few people, maybe with the exception of a Ron Paul, who really believe in the principle of the First Amendment, I really think free speech is just this universe, you just need to have it. The left liked it back in the 60s and, and, and earlier because they were the underdogs, especially during... Um, the well, the Cold War and the communist paranoia. So it was great for them. They don't like it so much anymore. And I think if, I don't think it's going to ever happen, or anytime soon at least, but if, if you get some weird reverse where uh, you know, actual fascism or something, well, they don't like free speech either. So I think that, yeah, things are viewed as a tool within a, within a power matrix. And so typically, and these things... Like free speech are just sort of bandied about as uh, as noble as it suits people because it seems convenient. It was convenient back in the day to talk about free speech. Now it's not so much. Now um, you don't want to other people or misgender people or yeah, uh, it's it's um it's a depressing situation that we find ourselves in. But I I do agree with you on that. I'll front. give you an example of how extra. I, I talked to a guy once who. I guess you could say mistakenly refer to a woman at work as a girl, um, not not any harmful way, and he was severely reprimanded uh, for it. I mean, I don't think he lost his job, but something <laughs> like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, l linguistics is uh, linguistics is very likely going to be one of the one of the casualties of this. Um, my my sort of position is, I'm not. I'm not, as they say, black pilled or nihilistic about this. I'm actually Good like, don't you. get me wrong. I was, I was livid about the election and the sort of brazenness of it when it first happened. But when you slow down, and you know, James, there was a political uh, philosopher by the name of James Burton wrote a really great book called the Machiavellian's Defenders of Freedom, um, and he advocates uh, when you reach this sort of point where. The volume seems too loud and where everything, uh, it's impossible to tell what's going on. Uh, turn the volume down. Stop listening to what people say and just try and analyze the battlefield as it, as it, um, as it is. Uh, stop listening to all of the clatter and the clang of the fog of war and all that sort of stuff and just try and see where the pieces are on the board. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm actually a little bit more optimistic. I think that there are incredibly optimistic signs for now i'm not like you know michael malice where i'm just like oh yeah it's in the or you know steve turley where it's like oh yeah it's in the bag man but um um there are th this coalition that's emerged in the last eight years uh as a sort of the preeminent hegemons of social discourse in the west um there are uh, there are very serious cracks within that uh, within that coalition. Um, there are very positive. There are very positive signs. Um, I can't. I won't. I I, I know um, we're we're sort of running up against time here, so I won't go into them right now. But there are very uh, there are signs of uh, there are opportunities for people in um, dissident spaces who have. Uh, genuine desire 
uh, an intellectual desire to try and articulate um, a different path for than the one that we're currently on. Um, I'm much more skeptical about how we're going to sell this to the people in power, but um, but but the opportunities are there. Um, I don't think that this coalition that's emerged in the last eight years, uh, I don't think that they're just infinitely hegemonically powerful. Uh, I think that a lot of the base of the right wing uh, or the is the anti elements of this coalition are not yet mobilized and they're sort of lost in la la land, but that's much the same of what we've been dealing with for 30, 40 years. Mm. But I, I do see cracks, serious civilizational breaking cracks within this, this ruling coalition itself. And I don't know, maybe we can go into those a, another time. Yeah, that would be great. Well, um, yeah, I think we're, uh, our time is up for the time being. It's super late where you are and I need to start my day slowly. So um, thank you, uh, Outremer, for, uh, for joining me, a uh, very savvy political commentator. You should hear his uh, historical lectures. They're even more impressive. Maybe uh, save that for another time. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'd recommend, by the way, to you, you know, if you ever want to put those historical lectures up on YouTube, you, know, you, should, you should do that. I, think be I, I, I am trying to find a way to, uh, to, to sell this more broadly. Um, the thing, if if I do if I do start a channel, I don't want to retread old content. I, I want to yeah. touch on new ideas. I want to try and move. Uh, a, a big thing I've noticed in the last <clears throat> two years, just as a closing state. By the way, uh, thank you for having me on, and uh, it's a pleasure to no, my talk pleasure. To you I'm and very everybody happy to talk uh, to you, yeah. and uh, speak to everybody in your audience. Um, the the only uh, the only thing I would end with is. There's something, I'm not sure if you'll agree with this, but in the last two years, it definitely seems like the actual, the intellectual value of YouTube sort of took a nosedive. Yeah, I don't that's know, true. It's, I, don't, it's I, I suspect true. what happened was around 2018, everybody sort of got involved in outrage porn. So it's like the day-by-day -day politics where, oh, can you believe this thing happened? Oh, can you believe this thing well, happened? It's a separate discussion, but yes, yeah. Um, everyone is a YouTuber, myself included. We've all become, to varying degrees, slaves of the algorithm. Yeah. And the algorithm, and you know, when you have part of your income dictated uh, by it, then it becomes relevant. And yeah, I think there's definitely been a kind of stultification for probably the last two years because certain things certain just work better than others. Yeah. Um, and I'll, but it, there's another is just sheer size because I remember YouTube from from the early you know tens and it, it was just so different. Um, it wasn't <laughs> as formulaic. I mean, these days it's like you just look at a channel like that's You're the, able to talk about whatever you yeah, want. This channel it's is like, the channel that shit. that cooks food outside in the forest. Like that's that type of channel. And then that channel is about uh, fishing, and it's it's just yeah, you could just talk about you what you wanted. You never knew what you were going to get, and it wasn't. It, it, nothing was typecast, and and that's part of the problem. Just the sheer size yeah. of it. Everyone is typecast. Like it's a, I, it's amazing how much has changed. Just yeah. the internet and the culture in general in ten years. I yeah, mean, yeah, and I think that's it's it's there are good points to that, and in terms of just accessibility, and if you hey you know you really want to learn about fishing, then there, you, you, it's easy to find this stuff. Um, yeah. you, you never built a computer before. You can learn that too. You want to know how to upgrade. The, yeah, this is all nice. But we've lost a lot of the spontaneity. We've lost a lot of the ingenuity. We've lost a lot of just that that freshness. And and I'm you know a perpetrator and a victim of this too as well. I have to concede that. It's just that yeah. if you want to exist in this sphere, to some degree, that's the game you have to play. Um, so yeah, just the just the way the cards and the chips are falling. But um, I miss the old days. There's no question about that. I miss the older oh, days can... of YouTube. Yeah. We can reminisce about the old days uh, anytime you want, but sure. uh, I, you know we're running up against time here. Yeah, so okay. I was just making a making a comment. Um, yeah. Thank you for having me on, and well, uh, yeah. like I said, been, well, been thank, thank you for joining me. I, I appreciate it. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.